Good afternoon, everyone. I'd like to extend a very warm welcome to you all for joining this RCNI webinar on supporting patients with menopause. Very many apologies. We experienced some technical difficulties at the beginning of this programme, which I'm sure you'll all be familiar with over the last two years. But thank you so much to our tech team for sorting it out so smoothly and we'll carry on with our programme. This is the second of a series of three free webinars focusing on all aspects of menopause care. And today we're going to explore how we as nurses support patients with the choices with their experience of menopause. And the fact that so many of you have given up your time on this lovely sunny afternoon uh, to come and join us really underlies to me the commitment and determination that there is in the nursing workforce to um, improving care and really transforming the experience of women going through that transitional time. So my name's Ruth Bailey, my pronoun is she, her. I'm an advanced nurse practitioner in sexual health in primary care. I sit on the RCN Women's Health Forum and I'm the nurses rep to the FSRH Council. And it's my very great pleasure to chair this uh, afternoon session, which I think is going to be a hugely valuable learning event. So on behalf of the RNI, I'd like to thank our generous sponsors who are Stella and A. Fogel and convey our thanks to the excellent panel of speakers that we've got lined up for you this afternoon. And I know that we're all really going to benefit from their expertise. Now this session will be recorded and it will be available on demand to you and I know that some people may still have difficulties joining with us so be reassured that they will be able to access this program. They will be um, able to receive a, a CPD certificate uh, via email after the event. There is a facility to use and ask questions um, in the chat function and I'll do my best to get as many of those questions to our panellists. We have lost some time, so our ability to ask those questions may be limited, but we are going to um, have the opportunity to quiz um, our expert speakers in a panel discussion. So we've got a packed programme and my challenge will be to keep to time. Um, so without any further ado, I'd like to introduce our first speaker. And this is Catherine Gale, who is a consultant nurse and the chair of the RCM Women's Health Forum. And Catherine's going to talk to us about understanding the menopause and all its challenges in 2022. Thank you so much for joining us, Catherine. And um, could one of our colleagues um, unmute Catherine, please? Catherine, welcome. Hi. Hello, thank you ever so much for a warm welcome. So if we could have the slides, that'd be brilliant. Brilliant, so I'm going to talk as a nurse consultant, I'm going to talk about the role uh, nurses uh, play in, in really educating and supporting women to understand their bodies, know their own minds about how they want to navigate the menopause and make some empowered decisions about uh, potential treatment options. And I'm so delighted to see that the programme today is a very holistic and inclusive uh, programme. So um, if you forward a slide, please. So yes, I'm a, a she, he, and I'm a daughter, sister, wife, and mother. I'm perimenopausal myself, and as a disclosure, I am on HRT. Um, I'm an independent consultant nurse and I have an honorary contract at North Bristol NHS Trust, but I'm also a certified coach and trainer working with healthcare leaders in the NHS and also a women around midlife. I'm the chair of the Royal College of Nursing Women's Health Forum and I'm the founder of Fluxdate, uh, which is my business where I offer coaching courses and consulting. So next slide, please. Why um, did I set up Fluxate? Well, uh, about eight years ago now, I thought I was going mad and I actually left my NHS job and I don't want any nurses or women leaving their roles because of the menopause. And I felt with myself, with my experience nearly three decades in the NHS, if I was unable to spot those early signs of the perimenopause, how could we expect other women to do that and join up the dots? 
And so that's what brought me on to uh, my research, which is working lives of menopausal women in the NHS, which I'm currently uh, collecting data on. Um, and also to look at uh, cognitive behavioural therapy, um, why women uh, are concerned about HRT and how we can support them to make a decision whether it's right or, uh, for them and also to ensure they're able to step up in the workplace rather than step out or step down. Next slide. So what why are we talking about menopause so much? Well, that's because there's a huge number of us. 13 million women in the UK are perimenopausal or postmenopausal. And therefore, a huge number of us will be experiencing or transitioning through the perimenopause into the menopause. And actually, as we live longer, we are spending on average a third of our lifetime at perimenopausal or postmenopause. And if we think about how our uh, careers have changed, how we are having children later, we are caring for our relatives, and also we are, many of us, working uh, potentially full time. Um, and the society's um, expectations of us as women has really changed. And so actually we're living longer. We want to be living a healthy uh, life uh, across our life course. And so menopause is not just about that period of time when you don't have any periods or your periods have stopped. It's actually about what can we do in our 20s and 30s to live a healthier life in our 70s and 80s and beyond. Next slide. So there's lots of latest research um, and I think it's important that we're aware of this because this is the impact of the menopause for some women. We know that over 900,000 women are thinking of leaving their job due to the impact of symptoms of the menopause and that's leading to a greater gender inequality in senior leadership positions and, and we have to, um, that is reflected in the NHS just as it is in, in other areas as well. We also know that 60% have taken time off work because of their symptoms and we know that 20% of those those that take eight weeks or longer off work will resign or retire. And if we think about nurses and those patients that we're caring for, we have a huge uh, responsibility to ensure that we get support for them while they're off work with those menopausal symptoms to ensure they can return to the workplace, particularly when we want women to be um, providing for themselves, be able to work, be independent, and, and particularly in a financial climate like we have now. So we also know that 77% will find one symptom very difficult, whilst 40% will find three or four symptoms more severe. And we know there are 34 symptoms of the menopause, and sometimes it's about uh, bringing awareness to all those different symptoms. For me, it was anxiety, insomnia and fatigue that hit me first, three years before I would get my first hot flush. And therefore we need, as healthcare professionals, to be spotting these signs when someone comes with anxiety or low mood for the very first time in their midlife and be actually asking the question, could it be the perimenopause? Uh, we know that a huge number of, of patients are offered antidepressants. We're more confident in prescribing antidepressants um, than we are HRT and we need to change that. Um, next slide. So just so that we are all on the same page, the menopause is when women stop having periods and she's had the end of her natural reproductive life. And this is from the, the NICE guidelines and the new NICE guidelines we're expecting next summer. And we hope that they will be a little bit more extensive and clarify some of the issues that we're still struggling with regarding the postcode lottery um, around HRT and uh, particularly testosterone. Uh, next slide. What's really important for us uh, is a knowledge of our menstrual cycles and, and able to explain to patients about the types of hormones that we have in our I mean, once we start menstruating, but also what happens to those during the perimenopause and then beyond. The oestrogen um, is the hormone in the first two weeks of the menstrual cycle, and this is mainly produced by the ovaries. It protects our heart, our brains, our bones, and it boosts our mood. Progesterone is in the second half of the menstrual cycle, and it protects the lining of the womb. It improves our mood and sleep, and it also regulates blood pressure. And then testosterone, we have three times as much testosterone as we do our other hormones, and yet we rarely talk about this um, and the impact of it and also about uh, replacing it. So this is for our bones, our muscle mass, our focus and our energy, along with it being available on the NHS for um, low libido. 
So what tends to happen in the perimenopause is these symptoms are in flux. They are varying in levels and therefore these symptoms are quite intense. And it's after the menopause when the periods stop that we um, notice these hormones are rock bottom, all of them. Testosterone, interestingly, is the one that we use for our energy. And in our 20s and 30s, it gives us our focus, our energy, our drive. And as that tails off, we can really notice the difference in our, our midlife and beyond, in our ability to, to that laser focus and concentration, not just libido, which is what it's described for, but also for protecting our bones, our muscle mass, um, and helping with sleep. Next slide. So the menopause, yes, it's a natural part of ageing that usually occurs between 45 and 55. Yes, it's a normal life course event, but how um, women experience it will be different. It doesn't mean it will feel the same for every woman. And that's really important that we take a very individualised approach um, to treatment options, uh, to the symptoms they're experiencing and the information we give them to help them navigate it. Next slide. So we often talk about menopause and what we actually mean here is postmenopause. We actually mean a retrospective diagnosis of when a woman is postmenopausal, when she's not had a period for 12 months. And as nurses, this is really important that we know this because when women present to us as patients postmenopause, say with some irregular bleeding, actually that's a red flag and it's a fast track and we need to be um, making sure that we do some investigations like a scan, possible biopsy to rule out things like endometrial cancer. So this diagnosis of postmenopause is when periods for, uh, you've had a gap of periods for 12 months. But the period of time where women seem to uh, really struggle the most is the perimenopause. The postmenopause, we actually find women um, settle into that um, a decrease in their hormones. They actually start feeling a little bit more positive. Some of those symptoms start to deteriorate, particularly um, as they go through 55, 60 and beyond. But it's the perimenopause, that 10 years before their periods stop, their hormones are fluctuating and causing uh, severity of, of symptoms. Now, the other thing that's very important for us as nurses is to be aware that not everybody will have the menopause between 45 and 55. Actually, one in 100 will be under 40. And it occurs for many reasons, genetic, autoimmune, many other reasons we don't actually uh, know about yet. But this means that we may well have a woman presenting uh, with a uh, a premature ovarian insufficiency and no periods before 40, in their 30s, in their 20s, around uh, their first menstrual period even. Next slide. The other reason why women uh, may uh, go through into the menopause is surgery. When we remove the ovaries um, with or without the womb, this will permanently induce the menopause. Now, even women who have retained ovaries, so if you know a woman had a hysterectomy with the womb removed but the ovaries retained, they are likely to go into a menopause um, earlier and the majority of them will go through uh, menopause within five years of their procedure. And also there will be uh, women who are following cancer treatment or through hormone blocking, um, potentially as part of uh, fertility treatment or um, treatment for heavy menstrual bleeding. We will be suppressing their menstruation and that in turn causes menstrual symptoms. So these induced and surgical menopause can be uh, very overwhelming, particularly if those symptoms are unexpected. And as nurses, we have a duty to ensure that, that women are prepared and it's informed consent that they understand the impact of their surgery or treatment on, on menopause and symptoms they may experience. Next slide. I hope everyone's hearing me because it's saying that I'm muted. Can you hear me okay, Ruth? I, I'm hearing you very clearly and uh, really enjoying your session, so please carry on. <laughs> Thank you. Just a message came up saying I was uh, muted and do I want to unmute? So it just made me a little nervous then. Um, so um, effects of um, hormone deficiency, it's really important we're aware. There will be um, people who believe um, that we need to replace all hormones uh, when they are deficient, um, like we do in, uh, insulin, like we do 
um, thyroid, thyroxine for um, hypothyroidism. Actually, I take a, a more middle approach. I believe it's about informed consent. It's about knowing what the symptoms are and, and looking at the treatment options for the particular symptoms that, that women are experiencing. So we do need to recognise that 80 percent of women will have vasomotor symptoms. So that's hot flushes, night sweats, for example. But we also don't talk about that loss of bone density that starts to tail off in our 30s, our increased risk of heart disease, putting us at the same risk as men or once we're postmenopausal, and changes to our brain and how it functions, causing lack of focus, um, brain fog and um, forgetfulness, which is what I'm just suffering from quite at this moment. Uh, next slide. So what are the most difficult symptoms um, that women mention? It's not always hot flushes. You'll find they'll come because of sleep issues and that leading to like a domino into um, uh, fatigue and um, stress. But the brain fog, maybe it's because of the sleep that they're also struggling with brain fog and it's also making them a bit more anxious. So you get symptoms knocking into other symptoms. And so if you have any women who are coming to you presenting on any of these aspects, it's really important to ask that question. Could this be the perimenopause? Because these are what women are presenting with. These are what women are struggling with and these are what women are wanting help with way before hot flushes or night sweats uh, come into play. Next slide. There are 34 at least symptoms of the menopause. And if you go on to my website, uh, which will um, is at the end of the slides, um, I've got a, a downloadable free ebook, which has got all the symptoms with some self-care uh, tips and, and reasons why we present with these symptoms. But I've broken them into physical, psychological, intimate, and um, also some more weird and wonderful ones on the next slide you'll see in a second. But if we talk about the physical, these are the ones that the women may not really be joining up the dots, the joint pain, uh, maybe the fatigue, uh, maybe hair loss, along with the hot flushes, night sweats and regular periods, maybe um, the palpitations, which might be linked to some of the psychological symptoms as well, that anxiety, the low mood, their first panic attack. Uh, you know, a rage uh, and mood swings through the cycle and also things that might be impacting them at work, like their memory, brain fog, concentration and irritability. We also need to be thinking about the intimate symptoms when someone presents with recurrent urinary tract infections. Could this be because of a vaginal dryness or atrophy? Would they benefit from a local oestrogen, which is very low dose, um, that would help uh, with vaginal dryness and soreness and also would help with uh, recurrent UTIs? Next slide. And some of the other um, slides that people, once they work out they're in the perimenopause, they actually start joining up the dots regarding itchy skin, um, burning mouth syndrome, electric shots, a, a strong body odour, um, becoming allergic to, to things that they haven't been allergic before. Next slide. Uh, one of the things that many women will uh, talk to me about is that they're wanting and desire, obviously, to try something uh, herbal. And I'm, I'm so pleased that we, we've got our sponsor today that help us to understand there are other options other than medication for, for the symptoms. So in our menopause and mental health document, the RCM published in 2019, we talk about the evidence around black cohorts, red clover and soya, which are great for the vasomotor symptoms. Black cohorts are not so good for the anxiety. But also we need to ensure that patients are aware there's no long term health benefits for this. Whereas compared to uh, replacing the hormones, we know that there is a protection of the brain, the bone and the heart. Uh, so it's really important that, that, that uh, part of informed choice, women are aware of that. Next slide. Uh, before I move on, then the other thing to remember is that, you know, it's really important to, to, to consider where and what women are taking because the doses may vary. So they may impact on medication they're already taking as well. So as a nurse, it's really important to talk to them about what over the counter medication they're trying. Um, one of the things that I wasn't aware before is this relationship between our thoughts and our feelings and our behaviour and our experiences. And this is where my training in cognitive behavioural therapy and my own um, relief with cognitive behavioural therapy has helped me to deal with anxiety. But what we know is women who have a negative expectation prior to the menopause are associated with a more difficult experience. And so we have a part to play in demystifying, in helping them to see both 
sides of the menopause, the highs and the lows so they're prepared and know what options there are, but also helping them to identify some control they can have regarding what options are out there, what decisions they can make to improve their experience. So what we know is a health issue will affect our attitudes and belief, um, and then that may well cause distress and change our behaviour. An example I use is a hot flush. If I was to get a hot flush now in front of you, and I was to think everyone's looking at me, they're thinking I'm looking awful. I then start to forget what I'm, I'm um, going to say. I'm starting to get quite uh, distressed. My heart's racing. I'm feeling hot. And that's going to mean that perhaps I end my um, presentation earlier. Perhaps I don't have the impact I want. Whereas if I start to see the hot flushes as, as a more neutral and not so negative, and actually it's just a normal part of the menopause, and that lots of women experience it, and my attitude is that it will pass, um, and that maybe if I take a cold drink of water, take a cardigan off, open the window, I'll be able to continue, and I will uh, be accept that will be accepted by those in the audience as, as they understand that 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 um, I need to take a moment, and that may make, give me the more confidence it may mean the palpitations don't come on and the anxiety um, doesn't affect my performance next slide so cognitive behavioral therapy we know there is strong evidence there's a great leaflet on the women's health concern uh, charity um, my training was by uh, myra hunter through the british menopause society and this we know there is strong evidence that cbt can alleviate uh, low mood and anxiety so it doesn't it doesn't cure it, it reduces its intensity and its severity. And we know that also CBT uh, can improve the intensity and severity of hot flushes and night sweats. It's particularly good for, for women who uh, can't take HRT. It's a really good option for them, particularly if they've had breast cancer. And also what we know is that it's very good for women who, who maybe HRT isn't the answer. It's something that will can complement nicely with a change in their thoughts and feelings around the menopause to reduce the in intensity, particularly around sleep, hot flushes, low mood. Next slide. The one thing that's really important to help women understand is that what's going on and why we feel so hot or cold is that actually our normal body temperature zone narrows in the perimenopause and beyond. So actually it only takes a very small difference in degrees of temperature for us to either be too hot or too cold. And it's actually a physiological thing that's going on. What we can do with uh, cognitive behavioural therapy is stretch that zone a little bit so we can normalise it a little bit and we can uh, take control so that perhaps we've got options regarding cooling ourselves down or warming ourselves up. Next slide. So I'm not going to go uh, through all my managing the menopause slides, but um, I, and I'm so pleased we're talking about lifestyle. I'm so pleased we're talking about psychology and I'm so pleased we're talking about inclusivity because uh, we, we need to remember all aspects of that. But the three things I focus on in CBT is that stress, how we manage our stress, how we improve our sleep and how we improve our mindset, how we talk to ourselves, our self-kindness and our self-compassion. Next slide. And we also um, know that complementary therapies, acupuncture, has often been reduced, um, reported as reducing hot flushes and night sweats. So it doesn't work for everybody. It's important that you choose your therapist wisely, that she's somebody who's got experience in women's health. And it may well be a placebo effect, but if it works for you, then um, it, I encourage it. Um, for me, um, acupuncture has worked very well on, on joint pain, particularly shoulder frozen, frozen shoulders. What we have to remember is the menopause is not a navel to knee. It affects all aspects of our body because we have, um, we have, um, oh dear, here we go. So this is what happens, I forget. We have sensors from our top of our head to our tip of our toe, hormonal uh, receptors that are affected and therefore we may well get be having patients presenting with joint pain and no other symptoms, not joining you up with the lack of sleep they're having. And so actually some of these other treatments may well be very helpful for hot flushes or for joint pain. Um, and uh, really it's about giving back some control and letting women decide what, what they Things they want to try and see if it works. Next slide. For most women, the benefits of HRT for symptom control outweigh the risk. Bottom line, obviously, if somebody has had breast cancer and it's been um, um, oestrogen or progesterone um, receptor positive, so it's influenced by the hormones, it's been grown by the hormones, then obviously that is a completely different situation. But for the majority of women, the benefits outweigh um, 
the, the risks. Our role is to convey that information so that they can make their own decision. And this is where sometimes the message has been distorted. And actually, we thought the risks are far greater. And as we're starting now to learn, it's important to take an individualized approach to it. What is the individual's risk? And, and what is the benefits they will feel? And then what do they want to try HRT or do they not? For some women, they will just want the reassurance. For other women, they will be keen to try it, but the, the side effects will be intolerable. So it's really important to let them know that they may get some side effects and we may need to alter the treatment they're on in order to minimise those side effects. Next slide. You see, yes, it's great for symptom management, particularly vasomotor um, uh, symptoms, but there are long term health benefits that we don't hear enough about the protection of our brains, our bones and our hearts. Yes, there are risks. And the big one that women come to us and ask about is the breast cancer, but we haven't conveyed the whole picture around that. Actually, um, the risk around breast cancer is a minimal increased risk and it's, it's um, mainly um, uh, associated with a combined HRT, so estrogen and progesterone, whereas actually there are far greater risks for women who drink more than two units of alcohol a night, don't exercise or are overweight. So it's about putting the individual's risks into uh, perspective and helping them to make an informed choice. And side effects, yes, we add in hormones, there will be side effects and there are ways that we can adjust that by the way we give the medication or the type of medication that we give. Next slide. So yes, replacing oestrogen with HRT is the most effective treatment for menopausal symptoms, um, but we need to be fully aware of which patients need to be on progesterone and which patients could benefit from testosterone. And um, the way to remember that is this little diagram I've got here is if there is a womb, a uterus, they need both hormones. If they've got no uterus, it's oestrogen only. And if you us as nurses can remember that, then we can, that's really a very basic level, um, which will help you determine whether the person's on the right medication or what um, HRT uh, might be an option for them and uh, looking at uh, what uh, might be best for them to protect their lining of the womb, the progesterone, and for their vasomotor and other symptoms, oestrogen. Testosterone, slightly different, more of a postcode lottery. Some women will notice a, a difference and others don't. Important to make sure the oestrogen levels are high enough and optimised, otherwise testosterone just converts to oestrogen. So th there is um, a, a important to just monitor uh, uh, ladies after the first three months and yearly to see how they're tolerating the medication. Next slide. Um, I'll start bringing it to um, a close. I know that I haven't got 79 slides, but um, uh, so health promotion. This is our opportunity as nurses, is that menopause is the ideal opportunity for health promotion. And we talked about it in 2014. Do we do need to do a menopause health check at 50? And it's never really materialised. Actually, it probably needs to be earlier than that. And if we take a life course effect like the Women's Health Strategy um, suggests, we can look at individual risks regarding obesity, maybe alcohol, smoking, um, exercise. We can look at initiating preventative strategies. We can encourage women to make healthy lifestyle choices before the perimenopause, through the perimenopause and beyond. And we can really advocate the importance of screening breast and uh, bowel, for example. Uh, next slide. Don't leave it up to the doctors. Um, you know, I see many people saying, well, I'm not a nurse prescriber. Actually, I only see ladies in a cervical screening clinic or I, I work on an orthopedic ward or um, outpatients. Actually, we all need to understand how our bodies, how female bodies work, the signs and symptoms to look out for, understand the options available, it, uh, having the information um, with, to read and consider and respecting patients' choices. So all of us can play a part in, in helping provide this information to patients. Um, what I would say is when we, uh, I feel the NHS has a real role to play in improving the health of female staff in the NHS. And if we get nurses' health right around the menopause, that in turn improves our care of women in, um, that we are looking after and are those in our community and our family and beyond. So if we really want to improve the health of women, I believe that we should be a good role models in the NHS in looking after our female staff. Uh, next slide. 
So I imagine a world where instead of this dread of the menopause and the fear of it breaking us, that menopause is the true making of us, that we can make some choices about how we want to age and live our life. And that is the world I am trying to create. Next slide. So I would like all of us to be thinking about what role we can play in normalising the conversation around the menopause and enabling women to seek support in the workplace and also um, when they come in to your care. Next slide. And Catherine. So, yeah, I've just uh, popped that slide up just so that you can make sure that um, um, the Women's Health uh, Forum, for the RCN, is a really good source of information, Women's Health Concern and the Richard Putt Menopause Society. Catherine, thank you so much for that incredibly um, uh, comprehensive overview of, of menopause and the things that, that we women have to deal with and your very comprehensive uh, vision of how um, we can employ the choices that are available. I could listen to you all afternoon, but unfortunately we have got um, to make up some time. Um, for those people that have joined us late in the programme, the, Catherine's fantastic uh, presentation will be available uh, on demand. Uh, as part of this recording. Catherine, your, your fantastic session has generated lots of questions, but I'm going to move straight on to our next presenter because we have some time to fit. Um, in your presentation, you focused on, on the sort of the difficulties that women have with some of the um, mental health aspects of menopause, and that leads us very nicely on to Nicola Wolf. Um, Nicola is going to talk to us about the, put the spotlight on menopause and mental health. Uh, Nicola Wolfs is a certified mental health and well-being practitioner and a personal life and executive coach and an EIA practitioner. So very, very uh, well versed to, to lead us through on some of the issues in menopause and mental health. Um, good afternoon, Nicola. Hi. Hi, Ruth. Um, hello, everyone. I'm delighted to be here and thanks to the RCNI for uh, me. Um, my background is, as Ruth mentioned, I'm a coach, but I'm also a mental health nurse and a nurse in intellectual disability or learning disability. I'm based in the Republic of Ireland and I run a business called Wolf Improve Limited, where we work with health and social care services nationally uh, in terms of um, regulation, training and quality. And also three years ago or thereabouts, I developed a training programme and coaching programme called the Menopause Maze. And the reason I did that was similar to what Catherine just said. It was based on my own experience, really. Um, I probably arrogantly thought that as a nurse, I knew what menopause was about and I really didn't. I was completely blindsided by my own perimenopause and it took me probably a couple of years, quite a number of years actually, to cop on to the fact that that was actually what was happening to me. And probably the symptoms that um, struck me most to begin with were those concerning my own mental health. Um, and they, they really took me by surprise. I wasn't expecting them at all. I kind of just assumed that hot flushes and periods ending were, you know, or periods changing were the indicators of perimenopause and knew nothing else about it. So I feel as um, women and also um, just to, to flag that I recognise totally that it's not only women, there are uh, some trans men who will experience men menopause and also some non-binary people. Um, and all of us can really um, reel as a result of the impact of the changing hormones. So I felt that that we've been disempowered by the fact that we didn't know what to expect and really that's not good enough. So my aim with the menopause maze was to try to um, educate people on what menopause entails. I work with uh, people one to one and also in groups and I work with health and social care services and I think it's really really important as nurses that we, um, because we're in an ideal position to influence practice and support that people get when struggling with perimenopause and we need to consider those people who do not have a voice. So those women um, in learning disability services or in long stay mental health facilities or chronic mental health conditions uh, very often menopause is completely uh, disregarded or not thought about and their symptoms are explained away by other things like behavioural issues or mental health needs. So it's very, very important that we consider perimenopause and menopause in those women as well. So as Catherine explained, 
already um, and I really enjoyed Catherine's uh, presentation, so I'm going to be quick enough through this as well to try and catch up on some time. But um, as Catherine explained, this is a, a time of real flux. A real uh, the menopause transition is a challenging time for us. If you could go on to the next slide, please. Um, it's a time of significant horm hormonal fluctuation and it not only impacts us physically but also mentally and emotionally and as I said uh, I missed that uh, initially I didn't realize that some of the emotional experiences I was having were actually connected with my changing hormones and I think that's a really common experience uh, we explain those symptoms of maybe loss of confidence loss of sense of self identity um, anxiety and depression we explain them away by perhaps the stress that's going on in our lives otherwise we may be rearing or rearing um adolescent children at the same time perhaps supporting older parents we may have re reached a certain level of seniority in our own work um and perhaps are in you know it's stressful in itself and that might all explain why we are experiencing perhaps a lower mood or anxiety symptoms. But actually what could be fundamentally happening is that our hormones are changing and fluctuating estrogen levels are challenging for our brain. It does not like it. Uh, fluctuating estrogen levels specifically affect the limbic system. And this is the area of the brain linked with mood, concentration, anxiety, libido, fatigue and motivation. The brain is more vulnerable when hormones are fluctuating. And in fact, there is a window of vulnerability to depression and anxiety in the late reproductive years into perimenopause and early menopause. That window of vulnerability absolutely exists. And especially for those women who've previously had perhaps history with regard to being sensitive to hormone levels or a history of depression or anxiety previously. Two of the most commonly experienced symptoms in the perimenopause are those of anxiety and depression. And many women that I work with will talk about those symptoms. And in fact, on, I should have also said that I hope that this conversation that we have doesn't upset anybody today. And um, because I have found that when I am having this conversation and providing information to people, for some, it is actually quite upsetting because they recognize themselves in it. So I do hope that you learn from this and I don't upset you with the information, but give you some tools to think about how you can help yourself and others as well. Next slide, please. So the hormones are central. They're central in terms of our physical health and they're also absolutely central to, to our emotional or mental health. Oestrogen, as well as all of the other um, roles it has in what Catherine has already explained, oestrogen also helps regulate several hormones like serotonin, norepinephrine and dopamine, and they may have mood boosting properties. So there is an impact on those as well on the brain. And oestrogen has very much got a role in terms of brain fog and clarity of thinking. And they are two very commonly experienced symptoms in perimenopause. Progesterone has a calming effect on our mood and helps us sleep and relax. And when it fluctuates in perimenopause, we can feel very irritable, uh, have a low mood and experience mood swings. And you can have anger and rage at those times as well. Testosterone is linked with our feelings of joie de vivre, energy, libido, clarity of thinking and concentration. And when our levels of testosterone fall in perimenopause, we can experience a lower mood, have poorer quality or clarity of thinking and an absence of joy. And in fact, many women that I work with will say to me, I know I'm not depressed, but I'm not feeling anything. I don't, I just don't feel joy. I can't, I can't get any pleasure out of what I normally would. So, um, I would just like to flag that 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 can happen. Now, apologies, my computer is telling me I'm running out of battery for some reason, even though it's plugged in. So I do apologize. I'm just going to make sure that it's linked correctly. Um, yeah, so that's to do with an absence of oestrogen and testosterone getting to my brain, because although I had it plugged in, I had one end disconnected from the other. So that's not going to work. So now we're OK again. So testosterone is essential in terms of um, that clarity of thinking and an ability to feel joy um, and get some pleasure out of your life. So next side slide, please. Fundamentally, during perimenopause, our brain energy levels are reduced. And this is an, another problem for us because it can make us feel like we are losing our IQ, that we actually don't necessarily feel we're maintaining our, our smarts, our intelligence. But it, it isn't about that. It's about our brain energy declining because of the changing levels of estrogen and progest and estrogen and testosterone in our brain. Our brain finds it difficult to um, use glucose in the same way. And we need glucose in terms of energizing our brain. So 
because we begin to feel less sharp, less capable, this can compound feelings of anxiety and depression. And I know Catherine previously referred to the fact that she felt she was going mad. Many people will say to me, and I would have said myself, that I feel like I'm losing my mind. I don't know who I am anymore. I don't know where I am. Um, I don't know what's going on. And for some women, that means that they will go to their GP and will be um, perhaps prescribed antidepressants or anxiolytics, or perhaps be assessed for early symptoms of dementia um, and maybe even be referred to a gerontologist. And that is really common and very frightening uh, for the woman who's, who's feeling that way. Another expression I've heard is that it felt like a fatigue of the soul. And I thought that was a very poignant explanation as to that missing energy, that missing joie de vivre that the, the woman was experiencing during these years. Suicide rate for women increases in the age range of mid 40s to mid 50s. Um, suicide rates have decreased except in that group of women and also in some younger women. And so there is a question as to well, what role are hormones playing in the person's mental health? Dr. Louise Newsom, who I'm sure you're all familiar with, states that there's a sevenfold increase of risk of suicide in women between 40 to, 40 to 50 years and that perimenopausal women are seven times more likely to have suicidal ideation. Um, that that's really important that we focus on that and when we're working with patients that we and, and thinking about the person's age that we think about well could it be the case that this person is experiencing perhaps suicidal ideation or intrusive thoughts do you do you seek that out that out that information out currently and if not perhaps it is something that we need to be considering more next question or next slide apologies um so the commonly experienced psychological symptoms of perimenopause are anxiety, which is really, really common. And this can happen in women who have previously not had any issues with anxiety, um, but suddenly begin to feel less able to do things. So I know of women who will, instead of going into a supermarket, will look at the outside of the supermarket to see how many people are in it before they decide that they can enter it. They may avoid driving on motorways, um, avoiding flying, all because of feeling quite anxious when previously they may never have had that challenge. They may also have palpitations with the anxiety, but not always. Uh, and that can be further frightening for the woman. The woman may experience panic attacks out of the blue, having never previously had them. And again, that can be quite terrifying. And she can begin to think that there's something wrong and she like that is a heart condition and not actually linked with anxiety. Low mood and depression of menopause is not uncommon um, with the woman feeling like the, with the reduced motivation, feeling very flat. And as I said, including intrusive and suicidal thoughts. Uh, there are people like Croft et al and Bromberg et al, have, they have flagged the increased risk of um, depression and anxiety in perimenopause. Um, Croft would say that there's twofold increase in uh, depressive symptoms in perimenopause. And Bromberger highlights that if a woman has had a history of major depressive disorder, then she's got two and a half times greater risk of depression recurring in the perimenopause than if she hasn't had that history. Also, the woman can feel um, very irritable, feeling quite rage filled, and that can be quite scary. Uh, the woman might not recognize herself in, in that. And there is a fallout then on the people around her uh, if those are the feelings that she's experiencing. It's not unusual to see relationships breaking down during these years because of the um, challenges that the, the woman is facing. Often feelings of sadness and tearfulness are very common and that loss of confidence and sense of self I also mentioned. And then furthermore, these symptoms of brain fog and difficulty concentrating can compound the feelings of depression and anxiety. And perhaps the key symptom that underpins all of the physical and psychological symptoms that we can experience in perimenopause is that of insomnia. A very large number of women going through perimenopause will struggle with inadequate sleep and sleep is essential, it's key to our brain health. So if we are having poor sleep and then also if we're having vasomotor symptoms, then our risk of actual, actually experiencing depression and anxiety rises because of that. So it's very important that we address sleep as well as addressing vasomotor symptoms and symptoms of anxiety and depression because sleep compounds all of that um, and makes things worse or an absence of sleep. Next slide. 
Mackie et al. suggests there are four contributors to the existence of depression or anxiety in menopause and perimenopause specifically. And they are a history of depression or anxiety. As I mentioned, Bromberger said that you have a two and a half times greater recurrence of your depressive disorder if you've had it previously when you're perimenopausal. Sensitivity to oestrogen withdrawal. So is the woman or has the woman previously had uh, sensitivity during her periods, perhaps experiencing PMS or PMDD? Um, uh, what was she feeling when she was pregnant? How did she feel postnatally? So to, that might give you an indication if she is sensitive to oestrogen withdrawal. Bothersome vasomotor symptoms and related sleep disturbances are absolutely relevant in terms of anxiety and depression and then psychosocial factors. And I'm going to go through the psychosocial factors a bit more. Um, so if you could progress to the next slide, please. So all the pre those um, categories, there's an intersection really with them and the menopausal transition and changing hormones that make um, the woman vulnerable to anxiety or depression during perimenopause. And these include the demographic situation. So we know that women who are of a minority status, lower income, low education, unmarried, divorced or widowed, we can face more challenges in the perimenopausal phase of life. In terms of the psychological uh, factor, if the person has got already got traits of anxiety, pessimism, rumination and worry, and I think Catherine also mentioned that negative attitude, if the woman has already got a negative attitude towards the perhaps the aging process, that that can further aggravate um, symptoms and uh, make them actually more intense during the perimenopause. In terms of the social or environmental factors, we know that childhood and lifetime traumas, like childhood traumas particularly, can uh, result in the woman having a tougher perimenopause than if she didn't have those childhood traumas. Other traumas, stressful situation and inadequate social support are very important in terms of how the woman copes with the changes that are underway. It has been shown that lower social support, marital dissatisfaction and few close family or family and friends are associated with increased depressive symptoms uh, and major depressive disorder. And then in terms of the health related factors, smoking can worsen symptoms, inactivity, there's an inverse relationship between inactivity and depression, sleep disturbance, as I mentioned already, and a history of mental health disorders, comorbid conditions, chronic pain, vasomotor symptoms and physical disabilities. All of those factors influence how significant the experience of perimenopause is and her risk for um, experiencing anxiety and depression during that stage. Next slide, please. So what as nurses we can do, we need to think about screening for mental health issues in perimenopause or menopause. Thinking about how hormones might be relevant to the woman's mental health. As I said, some women are sensitive to hormone withdrawal and they can be vulnerable to depression as a result. And also remember that we're not just looking or only thinking about women in midlife years. Um, one in 100 women under the age of 40 can be perimenopausal, one in 1,000 women under the age of 30. And as Catherine explained about premature ovarian insufficiency, that can happen at any point in life. So it's just to have it in the back of your head. Also with a younger woman, what are, are her hormones like um, and could they have a, a, any sort of impact on her mental health. So we need to be asking things like how her menstrual cycle affected her. Was her mood impacted at different stages of her cycle? Has she had any PMS or PMDD previously? How did she feel when she was pregnant? Some women would say they felt fantastic when they were pregnant, but then experienced postnatal depression afterwards. So how did she feel after the pregnancy is also key as well. Next slide. Consider using a men menopause specific mental health symptom screening tool. So there's a tool developed in Australia by Kulkarni called the MenoD, and this looks at typical features of perimenopausal depression. And then as well as using that, which is it's a very useful tool, but as well as using that, also consider using broader menopause symptom screening tools, such as the Green Climacteric Scale. And there are a lot of them out there. On my Menopause Maze website, I also have a symptom checklist. Um, and as Catherine said earlier, it's really good to prepare that for the woman to be able to prepare herself as well and apply those scales um, to herself so she can bring that information to the nurse, to the uh, GP, to whoever she's seeing in primary health care um, and illustrate what she's experiencing. And it's also really important to screen for suicidal ideation and intrusive thoughts. Next slide. 
In terms of treatment, if the woman has a history of depression or anxiety, then the treatment should include what worked for her before. So if she's had that history, what treatments were used, what worked before? And remember that antidepressants and anxiolytics can be used with HRT. And I know uh, the, Louise Newsom, for example, would suggest that the, the effect of antidepressants and anxiolytics in a person with a history of uh, those conditions um, can be heightened, they can, it can work very well with HRT also. And bear in mind that, and the NICE guidelines also say this, that the prescribing of an antidepressant or an anxiolytic in perimenopause to a woman who previously hasn't had a history of anxiety or depression is not considered the first um, choice of treatment, HRT is. If sleep and VMS are causing challenges, they need to be addressed. If other symptoms are severe and interrupting the woman's sleep or quality of life, they can contribute to um, low mood or anxiety. So you don't, you know, they can't be ignored. They must also be treated as well as any anxiety or depression. If there are social or psychological issues at play, then using psychotherapy and CBT is very important and very, very useful. Um, and certainly for women who choose or can't um, do not, you know, can't take um, HRT, then they, CBT can be very effective, as Catherine also mentioned. If the woman is sensitive to hormone withdrawal, then the treatment should include hormones. So from your history gathering, if you know she's had PMS, PMDD or postnatal depression, then hormones are relevant to her treatment. And it is important to be familiar with the NICE guidelines that were updated in 2019, that was the last time, and as they said, should be coming out again next year. The next slide. So the self-care that is possible and that you can promote to the people you support are things like supplements um, and I won't go through all of those but they're they can be of benefit to some women and um, key are lifestyle changes diet alcohol smoking and exercise and sleep and then medication be it HRT and non-HRT and also have all medication reviewed as they can impact and there can be interactions and they can impact on the woman's mental health next slide Taking care of the brain um, and, and your mental health. These are pointers that you can flag with the women that you support. And they are some of them are repeated in terms of prioritizing sleep. Staying socially connected is really important. Uh, challenging the brain, exercising regularly, breaking a sweat. And I would really push for encouraging women to do four things in terms of exercise. Look at their balance, look at their strength training, look at their flexibility and look at their aerobics. So there's four pillars. but um, um, certainly the University of Limerick did some study a few years ago where they looked at the benefits of resistance training and how they had the same effect in mild to moderate depression as antidepressants did. So some uh, resistance training would be really, really beneficial. Joining a class, taking up a new course, stop smoking if at all possible, it certainly will reduce the vasomotor symptoms and others, minding your cardiovascular health, balanced diet and looking after the gut and minding the head and brain um, and getting help. Apps like the Balance app, which developed, was developed by Louise Newson, is also a very helpful resource. Last slide, I think. I think it's nearly the last slide. Yeah, so what I would like to say is that um, we each have a unique experience and Catherine also mentioned that. So we can't presume to know what somebody else is going through. Uh, and it's really important that, you know, as well as comprehensive primary care, access to mental health services are needed, but also that the woman with information then feels empowered to focus on herself and engage in radical self-care. And preferably this should be done before the perimenopausal years. We should be encouraging women to be taking care of themselves in their 20s and 30s so that they go into this year, these years of significant hormonal fluctuation um, more prepared. So that was a rapid run through, but I'm conscious of the time that we have. So thank you very much. I can't hear you, Ruth. Thank you so Thank much, you so much Nicola, Nicola, for that uh, absolutely fascinating and, and helpful uh, overview of the mental health challenges that many women are facing. And I think I, I particularly was um, uh, taken by your um, advice on how we can thoroughly assess people and look at those risk factors. And also, it's been really helpful to look at the detail of self-care. And I think very often in, in the context of a busy clinic, they're the, exactly the things that are getting missed. 
list. Um, I wish we had more time to listen to you and to take questions, but we don't. We have 15 minutes to make up. And so I'm going to press on um, and I'm going to invite to the floor Dr Emily Simon, who um, I think will lead on very nicely from your presentation. Dr Emily Simon is a menopause specialist from Vera Health and she's going to talk to us about the importance of taking a holistic approach and managing um, symptoms through lifestyle change. Um, Emily, welcome. Hi there, hi, can you hear me okay? Yes we can, thank you. Okay, um, okay, can we... hi everybody, thank you for having me. Um, can we go on to the first slide? I think it's the first one, I want. yeah, okay, hi, yeah, this is me. Um, so my name is Emily Simon. I'm prime, my first role in life, I guess, is as a GP. Um, I now work as a gypsy, which is like a GP with special interest in women's health and sexual health. Um, I'm one of the clinical advisors for Vera Health, and I'm going to talk a little about Vera Health is a, um, a company and Stella, which you can just see written on the little uh, left hand corner of your screen looking at it, uh, is an app that I'm actually going to talk a bit about, which is quite relevant to this talk today. Um, I work as a I work as a gypsy for Harrogate and this is in Community Gynae Service, which is uh, it's a London based service NHS. Um, all GP referrals kind of come via us. We end up doing a lot of complex uh, menopause patients. That's often to, ends up doing what we're what we end up managing. OK, so next slide. So what do we mean when we say holistic? I mean, we use this word all the time in healthcare, don't we? Um, and it's really worth remembering always that all women are different. I mean, all people are different and all women are different. I think there's been, um, because of the kind of, menopause has become quite fashionable at the moment. You can, I don't think you can pick up a woman's magazine without seeing something about the menopause or HRT. You know, the, we talk about the Davina McCall effect, that she, you know, she's done these two programmes and everyone comes in and is like, I need HRT. Um, so there's been a strong push by the, by the media for HRT and this is a little bit reactionary to the fact that for a long time women couldn't access HRT and doctors were a bit nervous to prescribe it so we've kind of swung the other way um, and as a result of that sometimes we end up thinking or women will come in saying I need this this and this and it's like a one-stop shop of how you're going to manage your menopause whereas actually there's lots and lots of different compounding factors that affect you know how best to help women or manage women throughout the menopause and perimenopause. All right, next slide. OK, so when we're thinking about factors that influence our approach and these compounding factors, I just brainstormed just a few. There's obviously hundreds. Um, and this might be a little bit uh, kind of recovering what other people have said, but I think it's worth saying again. So age is a big one. You know, if we have someone with um, premature ovarian insufficiency, a woman of 39, um, you are going to be starting her on HRT because she's going to need it for bone protection and everything. Whereas, you know, if you have a woman who's 62 um, who's not been on HRT but wants to get on HRT now because you know they've read about it and they think it will be helping them you know I had, had a patient like this just this morning who has had a previous heart attack she's not going to be you know a, a suitable candidate for HRT. Um, thinking about symptoms there are some symptoms that are best managed by lifestyle changes some symptoms that are better managed by medication um, it really looking at each woman as an individual person when we talk about um, vasomotor symptoms, which is basically hot flushes and night sweats, 20% of women will have hardly any at all. And 20% of women will have like really debilitating, drenching night sweats. And it, most people will fall in the middle. So it's about like teasing out exactly what the symptoms are so that we can manage them appropriately. Ethnicity is a big one. I think someone is talking about uh, that later. Um, but for example, I work in a community where there's a high Somalian concentration of women and those women do not typically present, not even when they're suffering quite uh, quite severely with like back to back flushes. Whereas I also work in a more affluent area in London where everyone is, you know, very well, you know, reading everything and reading newspapers all the time and they're coming in and they've got their first bit of brain fog and they straight away want to go on HRT. So, you know, we do see these massive cultural differences um, and that is also compounded by social groups, social supports and things like that. Um, physicality is a big one. There are some women that are coming up to their 50s who are super fit, exercising three or four times a week. You know, they're very motivated by lifestyle intervention and kind of uh, kind of being on it for their, their own personal health. Whereas other people are like not very physically active and, you know, that is going to make a big difference on how much you can really encourage them through lifestyle changes. 
Um, personal medical history, obviously, is a big one. Breast cancer, previous clots, those sorts of things make a big difference. Um, there is there is a change in the thinking. A lot of women who previously thought HRT would be totally contraindicated for, it's not nowadays, but still, uh, these are people with complex medical histories. Um, taking a holistic approach is, is really, really important. Family history, I think we know about. Um, thoughts on medicine and hormones is quite is one that's, I think, going to become relevant in the future, actually, because I think probably what you're seeing as nurses definitely prescribing who do contraception is that there's this new generation of women and young girls, or well, young women and um, who are not very keen on taking hormones into their body and they spend a lot of time avoiding doing anything they can to put a hormone in and it's almost like we're trying to, in, I don't know, indoctrinate them with something very bad by encouraging these sorts of things. And when these women grow older, then, uh, you know, if you spend your whole life fighting and not wanting hormones under any circumstances, then to be told, well, you should take HRT, it isn't going to be very comfortable. And motivation is obviously a very big one because however motivated you are to make changes to your lifestyle is going to uh, affect how beneficial that is for you. Next please. Okay, so um, just thinking about options for management, I think it's all been said before. Um, HRT, estrogen replacement, I'm not going to go down that route, we're not talking about that. Alternatives to HRT, antidepressants, which is quite relevant to what the previous speaker was talking about. Um, some of them are actually can help with like uh, hot flushes and night sweats, as well as uh, the mood symptoms. Um, the GABA drugs, which is like pregabalin and gabapentin, we sometimes use for help, to help with hot flushes and night sweats in women who HRT is uh, contraindicated. And clonidine, which is a blood pressure medication, which we um, occasionally use for flushes. It tends to give women headaches, and I don't really love using it personally. Then there's all the herbal supplements, which we were talking about, black cohosh, red clover, evening primrose oil, uh, St. John's wort, some people say. Of all of them, black cohosh seems to be the one with the best evidence behind it, but still. We don't use that much. And then we get to lifestyle and mind and body. And these are the things I'm just going to focus on for the next five or ten minutes. OK, next. OK, so when you actually a massive cohort of women were asked about uh, what their thoughts are on the menopause, 95 percent said they would be interested in learning about lifestyle changes to help manage menopausal symptoms, which is a massive, massive number. Um, and I think it's worth remembering this because um, certainly as a GP when we're in 10 minute consultations and as nurses I would guess when you're on 15 minute consultations or 20 or whatever or 10 even um, we don't really have a lot of time to get, kind of think about how we can help these women and you know manage these lifestyle changes but women really are open to it and want to learn about them. Next please. So someone mentioned NICE before. So NICE is also trying to push us to be encouraging lifestyle factors. And they say a healthy lifestyle, including exercise, diet modification, and reducing alcohol intake can improve menopausal symptoms, in addition to improving heart and bone health. The menopause transition should be seen as an opportunity to review and optimise lifestyle, dietary intake and exercise uptake. I mean, it's all the things we've heard before. So good examples of lifestyle measures are um, avoid things that can trigger flushes, um, which are caffeine, alcohol, smoking and spicy foods. These are ones that we know have quite uh, has been shown repeatedly. Appropriate clothing. This is quite a small thing and something that we tend to overlook, I think, sometimes that actually when you are, if you're somebody who's suffering with flushes and sweats, actually layering is the most important thing so that you can, because after you have a hot sweat, during hot sweat you get very very hot so your body temperature actually goes up two degrees so you need to like dress up warm and then actually after the sweat you become very very cold so you actually want to take things off and layering is a really kind of just very it kind of doesn't even sound medical but kind of a nice bit of advice we can give to these women um regular exercise it has been repeatedly shown that women that uh, partake in cardiovascular exercise three times a week fare much better in terms of menopausal symptoms. Um, your core is really important and this is when I really am encouraging women to take up Pilates in their 50s for benefit now and also for benefit for their future selves. Um, and pelvic floor exercise is massive and I guess you know still pretty good at, at talking about that. Um, just as a reminder that the pelvic floor is the band of muscles that sit at the base of the pelvis which carries our uh, bladder, uterus and rectum and when we lose oestrogen the pelvic floor becomes much looser and weaker. Um, other things that have contributed to that are previous childbirth and labours and things like that. Um, and so really getting the pelvic floor strong at this point, people tend to talk about it postnatally but then forget to talk about it during menopause and it's really important at this time. Maintaining a healthy weight, 
sleep hygiene, which I think we spoke about already, you know, not looking at screens before you go to bed, uh, exercising during the day, making sure you're tired at night, hot baths, hot milk, you know, uh, valerian, some people find lots of these things, relaxation and vaginal moisturizers. I'm putting that in there because often that's the thing that gets forgotten about, uh, you know, in people that don't want uh, to use uh, estrogens or anything like that. There's a, a whole industry of vaginal moisturizers out there which are very, very useful for some women. Next, please. When we're thinking about mind and body interventions, um, we has been mentioned before uh, that there is actually really good evidence about CBT. Um, I was a bit surprised to find that CBT can really help, that cognitive behavioural therapy, can really help with women who are suffering from flushes and night sweats because it seems almost like um, you be, be very familiar with CBT being used for mood, anxiety, you know, depression, those sorts of things. But when kind of you don't think of it so often in terms of actually managing uh, kind of the more physical symptoms. And actually, they can, has been shown repeatedly that it can really help. Um, breathing exercise has also been shown to help. Uh, and hypnosis, interesting, something that we don't often talk about. Also, there's good evidence to show that it can help with some symptoms of the menopause. Yoga and acupuncture, also there's some evidence, not super strong, but not bad. Um, there's no evidence really on magnetic therapy, reflexology or chiropractic intervention. The fact that there's no evidence, if women use it and they find it beneficial for them, I think then, you know, thinking about our holistic approach, I think that's absolutely fine. Next. Okay, so specifically what symptoms can be managed just by lifestyle changes alone. Um, hot flushes and night sweats, which we've spoken about. Joint pain, really big one through diet and exercise. Uh, weight gain, obviously through diet poor sleep, irritability, anxiousness and low mood. These are the big ones that really can be managed with lifestyle changes. And one we don't think about because with reduced libido and definitely for doctors nowadays, and again, a push by the media, if someone comes with reduced libido, our first thought is let's get them on testosterone. Actually, there's quite a lot of things you can manage before you go down the medication route with libido. Um, I'll talk a bit more about that. Um, and then there's also things like vaginal dryness and prolapse. All of these things can be managed and the prolapse, thinking about the pelvic floor that I just mentioned before. OK, next. Please. OK, so this is where I plug the Stella app. Um, so like I said, Stella is um, has, Viva Health have produced Stella, this app called Stella. And what it is, is it's um, it's an app that you download on your phone or computer and it's a 12 week personalised plan. And it's very much symptom led. So in the beginning, a woman would, uh, from a checklist, would be asked which symptoms are the most important to her, like which ones are bothering her the most. For example, poor sleep, anxiousness, flushes, reduced libido, these sorts of things. Um, and then and it's a more a focus on symptoms which can be managed by cognitive behavioural change. And there's 13 symptoms in, to in total. I think nowadays, I mean, every time I read an article, there's a different number of menopausal symptoms. Like last, someone recently said there were 39. So, I mean, not everything. I mean, anything could be a menopausal symptoms, but there are the ones that are the kind of cardinal main ones that we're really thinking on menopause. Um, so using the Stella app, women will identify what issues are most bothersome. And then this app builds a whole plan around them. And it's like a 12 week plan and it's an educational tool and also a lifestyle tool. So it's teaching them what they can do and it's encouraging them as they go. It's very empowering and it's also incredibly practical. And I think it's a really good thing for us to know as, about as clinicians because we don't really have the time to hold these women and repeatedly encourage them and write a personalised plan and all of these sorts of things. And this app is really, I mean, it's something I hope the NHS will take on at some point in the future. Um, there is a year's free membership for RC Royal College Nurse members to trial it. Um, I think in the in the um, one of my colleagues is going to write the how to access that. It's voucher.onstella.com forward slash RCNI, but I think it will come up in the chat. OK, um, next, please. Um, yeah, so this is just kind of when we think of us as kind of clinicians, what are our main barriers to really advising our patients on lifestyle. Um, I think time, even though I put knowledge first, I'm actually going to move, I would really put time as number one because time is always the thing that we are always working under time constraints. Um, and it's, you know, 
when a woman comes in for a smear, for example, which is a really good opportunity uh, to talk about, like, you know, she's got having genital urinary symptoms of menopause. Um, you know, sometimes we might not go there because we don't have time and we just want to be looking at our very long morning list and wanting to work through it. So that's one thing. Um, knowledge. Emily, I'm going to just interrupt you on the subject of time. We're running really short of okay, time. I've got one minute left. Thank you so much. No worries. Um, knowledge is the other one you know like knowing what to say knowing how to direct these women particularly knowing what is evidence-based and what is not evidence-based um and thinking about how we can follow these up women up like we don't have such recourse systems that we can continuously be following them up repeatedly and that's why the app is so good next and next okay uh i'll just whiz through this this is just thinking about how to manage them holistically as uh, you know in a clinic in a clinical um encounter take time listen to their symptoms find out what's bothering them try and think about the wider picture their homework support structures think about what they want and what did you know what were their thoughts about their menopause and how they'd like to manage it and have some good resources to hand next next please hello yes so useful resources and this app, uh, the Stella app, really, really, it's a patient tailored tool and it's game changing for women. It's been proven to really, really help them. Um, Rock My Menopause, I don't know if you've heard about this, it's a very good support network um, and kind of helps women share their stories. Uh, Menopause Matters is a really good kind of basic up to date education and also I think has about availability of what things are out there and what current evidence is saying and it is changing all the time. Next. Oh, that's it. There you go. Thank you so, okay. thank you so much, Emily. And uh, it was extremely helpful, particularly focusing on some of those things that really get overlooked. Um, it's very um, interesting, the cultural differences that you um, uh, drew our attention to. And I really want to ensure that we've got time to explore that more fully in the in the panel discussion. So we should be taking a short break now, but we're not going to because uh, time is of the essence. So I'm going to invite and welcome Welcome Eileen Durwood, who's a menopause expert and head of uh, product device line at um, A. Fogel, who's one of our sponsors. And um, Eileen is going to pick up on some of the, the concepts that we've explored today, uh, which is when HRT isn't the answer, and just exploring some of the natural options for menopause tran uh, transition. And, and while um, Eileen is um, giving her our presentation, I'd be really grateful if our, if our uh, RCNI are able to confirm whether we have a, a little bit more time just to, to really make the most of the expertise that we have on the panel discussion. So Eileen, thank you so much for coming and, and sharing your presentation today. Thank you very much and thank you to all the speakers so far because your talks have been really interesting and we are a company if, if you've not heard of us we're a Swiss company that has been on the go since 1963 and we grow and distribute herbal medicines around the world. Um, we are a trust so the majority of the profits go back into research and this is an area where we are very, very interested in. I've been with the company over 25 years and for the last probably eight, nine years, I've been focusing on the menopause, looking at it holistically, which um, all the lovely speakers have been doing as well, and also looking at how herbal medicines can fit into the modern menopause scenario. So if I could have the first slide, please. So when HRT isn't the answer, and we know HRT can work wonderfully well for so many people, but for some women, there are some gaps. Next, please. Next slide, please. Next slide, please, thank you. We stuck great, thank you. So as mentioned before, there are women that can't take HRT because they may be um, suffering or being treated for things like breast cancer. There are those women that have tried HRT but really haven't been able to tolerate it with side effects or, or other reasons why they can't continue with it. And there's also those women who prefer to try going down the natural route first to see whether it would be suitable for them. Next, please. So today I'm going to look at two herbs that um, 
we've done research on, and these are evidence-based symptom support curves. So one of them is SAGE and the other one is Agnes Castus, um, which could be quite a mouthful and we get quite a lot of different pronunciations with the Agnes Castus. Next, please. So the SAGE extract, we use the common SAGE plant, which is Salvia officinalis. This particular product is MHRA registered for the relief of hot flushes, night sweats and excessive sweating associated with the menopause. Now the MHRA, as far as regulation with herbal medicines, we basically have to prove quality. So we have to prove that what we say on the box is in the bottle. We have to prove in most instances at least 30 years safety data. And we also have to prove what's called traditional use. So SAGE has been used across Europe and in the UK for many, many years as a relief for um, symptoms and hot flushes and, and night sweats. And interestingly enough, there is also research now, just very recent research, showing that SAGE can have a, a, a very um, sort of soft but a good effect on mind and mood. So it's not a, a permanent effect, it's a sort of transient effect as and when you would take, um, take the herb. Next, please. So the first clinical trial, so this was done in 2011 and it was an eight week clinical trial. So after baseline week. So the women had to be through the menopause at least 12 months, having at least five hot flushes a day, and also the total score of the mean number of intensity related hot flushes. So by the end of four weeks, 50% of women noticed that their hot flushes had been reduced and 68% by the end of the eight weeks. And very interestingly, the herb seems to work better on severe hot flushes than mild hot flushes. So the difference between them, so mild hot flushes was 46%, moderate hot flushes 62%, severe hot flushes by 79% and 100% um, with very severe hot flushes. It's also very well tolerated um, as such. Next, please. Um, and that study was um, randomized, double blind, placebo controlled. So the second study was done in 2021, so it's quite a recent one. So this was 80 women between the age of 48 and 65, menopausal again for at least 12 months, and again experiencing at least five hot flushes a day. So the, the menopause rating scale is the sum of a range of symptoms, including hot flushes. So it's not just about hot flushes, it's about hot flushes, heart discomfort, sleep problems, joint and muscular discomfort, depressive mood, irritability, anxiety, and physical and mental exhaustion, and also changes in sexual desire, activity, satisfaction, bladder problems, and vaginal dryness. So the MRS looks at all these other symptoms as well. And as has been mentioned before, very often one menopause symptom can have a domino effect on other symptoms as well. So again, what we found um, over this study was that there was at least 50% reduction in hot flushes after four weeks and a 51% in the, the um, the live group, if you like, compared to just 26.9% in the placebo group. 64% reduction after eight weeks and a 39% improvement after eight weeks. And as with the previous trial, the improvements continued at the end of the trial period. So if the, the, the women continue to take the SAGE, then it seemed to have a, an a, an accumulative effect, the longer you take it, the more benefit that you would be likely to get as well. Next, please. Looking at SAGE, so this is 
um, our particular product is got a traditional herbal registration by the MHRA. We have no estrogenic action. So this can be taken with HRT. It can be taken with um, contra oral contraceptives or hormonal contraceptives if anyone is taking it in the perimenopause. It is suitable alongside HRT. Um, and what we found over the years is that a, a lot of women, the HRT is working really well, apart from maybe just one stubborn symptom that's not responding particularly well. And one of the main symptoms is hot flushes and night sweats. So the SAGE is a lovely one to take alongside the HRT to help with this extra um, depressing, uh, depressing symptom. It's suitable for long term use. There, there is no specific time limit with this one. Um, and because of the THR license, it's suitable for diabetics and also for those that are on thyroid medication. With the patient information leaflet, because this is licensed, we have a patient information leaflet and on the patient information leaflet, there are no side effects listed, um, which is a great as, as far as the product goes. Next, please. So Agnes Castus, this is MHRA registered again for the relief of PMS symptoms. So this is irritability, mood swings, breast tenderness, bloating, menstrual cramps. So this one we use a lot for menstruating women very successfully. It can take two to three cycles to kick in. Um, again, it can be taken long term, but it's more of a regulating one. So a lot of women find that they don't need to take it ongoing once it's, it's done its job. Next, please. So the research, there's been several studies done, so it's an effective and well tolerated treatment for the relief of symptoms of mild and moderate PMS. It's also effective and well tolerated and shows obviously um, a better benefit than placebo. Next, please. Next, please. One of the other things that, that we found over the years is it's a really useful one on the run up to the menopause. So this is the area of the perimenopause where women may find their periods are starting to change. They may be increasing in severity, so they may be getting more cramps and pain and discomfort. They may be getting more breast tenderness. They may find that they're getting a shorter cycle and that the bleeding is heavier. So these symptoms may not be enough to warrant any other treatment, but obviously they are distressing enough on, on their own. Um, so we use this one quite a lot. The only thing I would say with this is with the heavier bleeding, we're only talking mildly heavier. If women are flooding, if they are bleeding for more than seven days at a time, if their periods are running into each other or are very, very close together, then this herb is not going to be suitable. And we always advise um, seeking medical advice in that situation. Next, please. There are a few contraindications for this one, so it's not suitable with pituitary gland disorders um, or estrogen sensitive cancer. And basically, it's not suitable with any other HRT um, or hormonal medication. So on the run up to the menopause, if someone is in the perimenopause, they can't take it if they're on the pill, the coil, the patch, the injection or any other hormonal medication. And it's the same if someone's on HRT, it's not recommended. Next, please. So there we go. Thank you. So I've, I've tried to speed it up and I'm now quite breathless. Um, but um, I hope that, you know, you will take a look at these remedies again for that group of women who um, may be finding it that little bit more difficult to find something um, to help them. As a company and for myself as, a, as an advisor, again, like all of the other speakers, we don't just look at giving the client something. We also look at lifestyle, diet, 
um, our website for those of you that, that are interested in it, um, www.avogel.co.uk. We have lifestyle tips, we have um, um, recipes. So we, we are, again, we are giving a, a holistic approach to everybody who's uh, on this journey at the moment. Um, so thank you very much. Eileen, I'd like to thank you so much for that presentation. It's certainly an area that um, I think many of us here know uh, little, about, little about and to have those resources is, is incredibly helpful to give people as much choices as we possibly can. So, so thank you for that. Um, I, I'm delighted to say that we can have our 15 minutes. We started 15 minutes behind schedule and we can keep those for our panel discussion, which I'm I'm really looking forward to. And I, I would like to to welcome to our forum our panel um, uh, of experts. So I'd like to welcome uh, uh, Nina Kuypers, who's the founder of Black Women in Menopause. I'd like to welcome Dr. Carl Neff, who's a consultant endocrinologist and clinical need for the National Gender Service in Ireland. And welcome back Catherine Gale, who, who kicked off this afternoon's programme with her overview on menopause. Um, uh, welcome to, to our panellists. I can't see uh, Nina Kuypers and Dr. Carl Neff. I would love to uh, be able to see them. Here they are. Welcome to this are. afternoon. Thank you. Thank you um, very much. And, and to invite them to come and talk to us around the issue of diversity and inclusion in the menopause, supporting vulnerable and underrepresented groups. And I, I wonder if perhaps I could uh, invite uh, Nina Kuypers, founder of the Black Women's um, Association, Black Women in Menopause, and, and Nina, uh, one of the things that we've highlighted this afternoon are the experience of cultural differences in menopause and, and the fact that um, uh, the way that people view their um, uh, symptoms and experience those um, can vary from culture to culture. And we also know that there's a huge amount of uh, research that um, clearly shows us that um, uh, racially minoritised uh, patients receive poorer outcomes in care. It's a huge issue and I wonder if you would like to, to start by just giving us a view uh, of where you see, uh, what, what you see as the issues for black women in, men in menopause. And uh, Nina, you're currently on, on mute. Invite one of the tech team to unmute uh, Nina, please. Um, Nina, you'll have to do it yourself. It's in the top right hand corner. We have given you. OK, what we might recommend then, Nina, is if you leave the chat and then jo um, leave the call and join us again, because unfortunately we're unable to unmute you from this end. Thank you. And I'll hand over to, um, while we're waiting for Nina to join us, um, I'll hand over to um, uh, Dr. Carl Neff. Thank you for joining us. Um, and I wonder if I can pose the question to you and just to, to give us a sense of what you see as some of the issues in terms of diversity and inclusion, supporting women who are suffering with menopausal symptoms. Um, yeah, I suppose I'm speaking to you from the perspective of a um, of gender diversity, really, in terms of transgender people and non-binary people um, who may be going through either menopause because they were female at birth or menopause in the sense of withdrawing oestrogen um, as part of a medical transition, which is, you know, once people reach their 50s, 60s or beyond, sometimes decide that now is the time uh, for different reasons that they're going to withdraw from oestrogen. Uh, so I guess really it's just about understanding that there will be uh, increasingly as time goes on people seeking support who may not fit that kind of um, binary cisgender phenotype that of course menopause um, services are primarily aimed at and primarily attended by. Uh, it's just to recognise that sometimes you will have uh, transgender men or non-binary transmasculine people um, who may have been on testosterone at some point in their life and may no longer be on testosterone who will go through uh, menopause in the same way that a cis woman will. Um, so it's to n acknowledge that I guess really and to talk about it in some forum just so that people know that some men will go through menopause in the same way that a cis woman will and that they do need probably 
to be treated exactly the same way, that the only complicating factor would be potentially the use of estrogen or estrogens or transdermal estrogens, um, which may not be acceptable to them. Although things like pessaries and so on may. So hormonal therapy uh, for men, estrogen based hormonal therapy um, can still be appropriate. And actually for some men, even the oral or transdermal um, may be appropriate too. Uh, when it comes to trans women, so these are people who are male at birth, um, they will only go through menopause if they've had their gonads removed, if they've had their testes removed um, when they stop their estrogen. Uh, and in that scenario, that would be a minority of people these days. So most trans women or trans feminine people have not had uh, their gonads removed. So most will not and need support. But we do now see uh, trans women coming off estrogen seeking our advice, but sometimes we'll seek advice from local GPs or menopause services in Ireland uh, about how to manage the symptoms of menopause. Now it's a bit easier in that scenario because you can actually gradate the withdrawal of estrogen. You can gradually reduce the the um, the estrogen doses over time and as we all um, understand a lot of the symptoms and the more severe symptoms can be from those very significant and, and large fluctuations in estrogen concentrations. So lots of that will be mitigated um, by the ability to gradually reduce doses over time. However, in saying that, we should also again acknowledge and be aware of the, the need for some trans women to seek advice about some of the symptoms that um, will occur despite doing a gradual withdrawal from estrogen therapy. Uh, oh, thank you. Um, if I can pose a question, um, what about the experience of um, patients who are are, are unwilling to uh, consider estrogen treatment because of the uh, because it resonating with their with their with their previous life, the dead life that they don't want to be reminded of? How, how, can you give us some um, sense of um, the kind of things that a conversation should contain? Yeah, so you're talking about trans men or people who are female at birth who may not want to use. Yeah, or so I guess it comes down to, as, as or non-binary well. people. Yeah, so so the people who are um, female at birth who have again retained their gonads, which is the majority who will go through a, a, a menopause, a physiological menopause, in the same way as cis women will go through. Uh, in that scenario, it will really only apply to those not on hormone therapy, because of course testosterone will act as a sex steroid and they won't have symptoms um, during uh, the failure of their own uh, gonads. But the uh, things to talk about really is just to, to start off really understanding where the person's comfort zone is. So some people are very um, comfortable talking about their um, gender at birth, about their sex, about the fact that their sex and their gender are discordant. Uh, and you can talk very openly about things uh, with them, other people feel very uncomfortable acknowledging their sex or their, you know, their gender assigned at birth. So I would start off with explaining um, what you're going to be asking and why you need to ask it or what you need to talk about and how that person would like. So giving them the information that you as a clinician will need to talk about, let them know that the things that we'll be asking or talking about today will be A, B and C. And how comfortable do you feel about that conversation or how would you like to approach that conversation? So obviously as clinicians, there are things that we need to talk about and ask about that sometimes the people we're talking to um, don't feel comfortable speaking about. Um, so I would always start the consultation. So in this a clinical consultation, for clinical reasons, we need to know this information and we need to ask about it. And um, how would you like to talk about it? While having to acknowledge at some points that there might be things that they don't like acknowledging that will need to be acknowledged as part of the, the consultation. Uh, thank you. I think that's that's really helpful, and uh, I know that many people have anxieties um, dealing on and and giving care for those um, people that come from the trans community. Uh, and I know that there's a huge amount of research that that demonstrates that uh, that patient group have have really a very poor experience of, of healthcare. And I know that people are, are, are really committed to, to putting that right. Um, I wonder if there are any um, resources, particularly for um, uh, around managing menopause in the trans community that you're aware of or you could direct us to? Unfortunately not. So in terms of being an unrepresented group, trans people are to my eyes at least completely unrepresented when it comes to menopausal ser or menopause services and uh, talks about menopausal symptoms and I think there's a balance there for sure I mean of course 99% of the people that you're going to see in menopause services are cis women um, but there is a small minority and this is one of the issues that a small minority of people who um, might be female at birth, so trans men and trans masculine people, for example, who feel, well, I can't really go to menopause service, that's for women. We have the same issue with uh, trans women in terms of breast checks and the National Breast 
um, cancer screening uh, program in Ireland, which is a very feminized environment and very much targeted towards cis women appropriately because that's the vast majority of the, the population. But there needs to be some way of balancing that out. What we do in our services, we let the people know themselves. Uh, listen, as time goes on, you're going to need to access these services. It might not feel very comfortable, but it's OK to approach them and talk to them. And what we do in the clinical side then is we talk to the clinicians and say, uh, so I actually write the discharge letter. So once people have established their medical transition and there's no psychosocial or other issues uh, present, they're discharged from our service back to primary care and our cohort are very young, so they're in their 20s. So normally this is like a in three decades time, think about this type uh, piece of advice. But in the discharge letter, we give very clear care plans and the way I phrase in the care plan is please advise this person to so say for say trans women going to a breast check and um, please advise this woman on uh, breast cancer uh, screening and breast care in the same way that you advise a cisgender woman so i think by actually saying that to clinicians then they know okay i can talk about it in this way uh, it is as you say there's there's research saying that trans people have a very negative perspective on and many different uh, healthcare in general, to be honest, uh, and many different specific services, including potentially uh, menopause services. But and, and unfortunately, it's getting into this weird and we're all very much aware, I'm sure, of the political milieu and the, the societal um, conversations that are happening about the um, about gender and about you know women's spaces and so on so there's this huge amount of fear both on the clinician side about i can't even talk about gender and then on the trans person side going the second i go to a healthcare environment they're going to exclude me or they're going to denigrate me or it's going to be a horrible experience and so i do think there's a much bigger piece of work that comes outside of menopause but in terms of healthcare in general going some people are trans that's okay um, for the clinicians and for the service users or the patients, because at the moment all we have is escalating fear on both sides of the table, the consultation yeah. table, and uh, it's a huge issue, not just for menopause services, but for every service that unfortunately is just making, ironically, making the problem worse, not better. Thank you, and I, I can see that Catherine's nodding her head there. So Catherine, I'd like to bring you in on the on, on and to comment on that. And, and Catherine, you're on mute. Thank you. Is that OK now? Because I looked like I'm on mute. So OK, great. Um, so for me, yeah, absolutely. I, I feel, you know, yes, women's um, uh, outcomes regarding health inequalities are lower. We know that they have worse outcomes. They're on more medication. They have more consultations. They have longer waiting times. But if we then break down, uh, it, you know, into people who are, are transgender or underrepresented or multicultural uh, parts of our community, then actually the health outcomes are even worse. And so it's really important that we are looking at the very individual experiences and really listening to everyone about what their experiences are and designing services around that rather than just what we assume is everybody's experience, what everybody is looking for. So it's um, for me, it is all about that individual in front of you, having uh, treating them with respect, having equal access, whoever they are, for whatever treatment and advice they need. Um, th thank you so much. And I think that's really been a theme of this afternoon, um, which is which is around really listening to what patients, what, what are the symptoms that are bother bothering the individual and what can we put in place for them? What are their choices? Um, which may be HRT, but it may certainly not. It may be um, looking at lifestyle choices or some of the um, uh, complementary choices that we've heard today. I do believe that we've got Nina um, back on screen. Um, Nina, we can't see you um, and you're muted, but um, I wonder if you're able to unmute yourself now. So we would really like to hear um, uh, uh, around your experience setting up black women in menopause. Hi, thanks for having me. I'm um, really I, sorry we can't I, see you, but I'm great to be able to hear you. <laughs> Hopefully that will come, but I'm obviously grateful to be here. Um, hopefully the camera will come on as well. In question, is black menopause different? Well, I don't have all the answers. And what I can do is speculate off using my own lived experiences and also reflect on some of the limited data out there and speaking to many of the people that attend black women in menopause. From yeah. Sorry, go on, Ruth. Uh, I was going to say it would be really, really uh, useful for all of us. 
Um, as you may or may not know, the biggest study to date is the study of the women's health across the nation, the SWAN study, which reported that black women may have a longer transition, experience more severe symptoms and enter menopause to two years earlier than our white counterparts. And in another study in Nigeria, they also found the same. However, the reasons why are not clear, nor has any research to date investigated the possibilities of this. A pattern for myself does begin to emerge where the specific and nuanced experience of black women aren't factored into the conversations about menopause. There are no references to black women's experiences and differences which may differ from, say, the classic online information, which is solely based on white women's experiences. And I think the failure to consider such variations among black women not only diminishes the importance of our experiences, but also leaves the understanding of menopause research data as biased and distorted in all aspects of life. Suppose research issues does matter and it is integral to, integral to distrust in the medical profession. It affects people's confidence, not to mention the impact on their quality and quantity of life. And it makes people less likely to seek and or attend healthcare appointments and ignoring cultural factors can lead to miscommunication, discomfort and mistrust. For myself, it's about broadening the accessibility of information of menopause across society so that not only these decision making roles recognise, acknowledge and champion wider inclusion as it's important in bringing parity to menopause for all. Why our feelings about gender and stereotypes are something that have been developed historically throughout history. And when you are part of the dominant group, and in this case, white, it is people's whiteness and the privilege that affords you that has prevented you from actually realising that race plays a massive part, as you would say the same of men, which is androcentric. For example, imagine being a black woman where the discrimination that we face is double and we are here today because it's deemed OK to speak about menopause. But if we put the word black woman in menopause, then do people's eyes roll? What does that have to do with menopause? Well, there are multiple reports about how society is failing menopausal women and that services have been created by men for men. Being a black menopausal woman has an added dimension in which we further need to untangle the misogyny and privilege. People do need to recognise their biases and prejudices. I do not believe people who say they do not have biases or prejudices. We all have some form of conscious and unconscious bias. Yes, there's a plethora of research that shows that people's health, professionals, beliefs and biases of black, black women are linked to racial disparities in health and in health care. Often their biases are unconscious, but they still affect care and recommendations provided and the trust that that person has in recommended treatment. It's difficult because menopause support groups and those championing menopause also need to reflect not at certain times of the year. 
They need to ask themselves what questions, actions have you taken and could you take in the longer term to grow and nourish the menosphere with colour. It's a time to celebrate diversity and inclusivity in menopause, whilst also taking time to reflect on the current as well as the past challenges faced by society. It is a missed opportunity of health professionals to inform a wide representation of today's society about menopause. Thank you, um, Nina. I think uh, that's certainly uh, given me something really to think about and, and some of your uh, presentation, it makes for very uncomfortable uh, listening and I can only imagine, well, if it's uncomfortable to listen to, how, how, how uncomfortable that experience must be for uh, black women with menopause who are not getting the, the, the care that, that they deserve and that they have a, a right to, to receive. And I, um, it, it, it's very difficult to listen to and I'm really grateful to you for coming to talk to us uh, in such a powerful, hard hitting way. And I'm sure that I'm not the only person that's really uh, deeply reflecting on, on, on what you've said and, and noting how um, some of those injustices actually chime and uh, um, with the presentation that that uh, Carl was giving before you you joined us around there are sections of our society who who are um, experiencing actually deeply wounding uh, prejudice and not benefiting um, to, to be uh, accessing the care and to be living the lives that, that they should be able to to live. Um, Catherine I'd like to, to bring you in on the on, on what are your thoughts on this? Yeah, so my research at the moment is about um, actually the workplace, menopause in the workplace, but I really want to, to make sure that we don't make the same mistakes we've made in health by, you know, our services, just like Nina said, being, you know, designed by men for men. And then we suddenly look at trying to improve the workplace um, around menopause. And then it not reflecting what we offer as support, the needs of those in the workplace, because our workplaces very much mirror the societies that we live in. And so for me, it, there's there's some aspects that I, I feel we all need to consider, which is the language we use, the taboo, the stigma around this, how in some, for some uh, parts of the community, there's even more stigma around talking about this. Um, also, uh, you know, if we talk about people um, being encouraged to speak to their manager about it, depending on their position, their role, uh, whether the gender of their manager, that may also be difficult for them compared to somebody who might already be in a sort of middle management position. And we know that, particularly in the NHS, we know that those in the higher grades and positions are less likely to reflect our community, the diversity and the multiculturalness of our community. So it's really important for, 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 that we, we uh, you know, look at this now to make sure that one, we're listening to people's experiences. So as a qualitative researcher that I, I feel really passionate about that. We know, for example, black women are underrepresented in, in research. Women are underrepresented in research. We also know when people go and talk to in a consultation, we only listen for an average of seven to 11 seconds um, of them telling their story, their experiences. How can we learn about the unique experiences of that individual in front of us? We're only going to listen for seven and 11 seconds. We're already bringing our own um, uh, expertise and our, our unconscious bias to that consultation. So really it's about one, it's making sure that we listen, it's asking what people need, want, how we can support them and champion them to have equal access um, to services that meet their need with dignity and respect, but making sure that uh, the information reflects uh, their needs as well. So um, there's some things for me to think about as I'm just on the data collection side around, you know, what reasonable adjustments organisations can make to make sure that our menopause, particularly in the workplace or in healthcare, reflects the needs of, of those affected by the menopause, whatever diverse background they come from. 
Thank you. Um, I'm going to pose a, a question to our panellists. Um, one, one of the features and one of the themes that's come out on several of the presentations this afternoon has been about the need to intervene earlier in women's health. So rather than waiting until uh, people are really struggling with um, these symptoms that are, are really impacting on their ability to enjoy life and, 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 to, and to live and, and to work and to function, um, that we're missing an opportunity to, to look at lifestyle interventions much earlier on down the line. And I, I, I wonder if I, if I could ask um, our panellists just to comment on, on what you think the opportunities might be. Um, uh, Carl, when you're talking about the, um, the trans uh, non-binary community, do you think there's opportunities to look at that earlier on down the line? Um, certainly it's something that we do when we're talking to people, let's say usually at the point of discharge and um, that we talk about what might be coming down the tracks in terms of healthcare needs. So certainly you can have that conversation at that earlier point, um, which we do, but that's the point that we usually have it is when, we're, when they're leaving the service and we give them uh, advice on their ongoing care. Um, um, thank you. Um, so, so yeah, and I'm so sorry to let you know that I unfortunately have to go um, pretty much now, but thank you all for having me and, uh, uh, and enjoy the rest of the chat. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, uh, Nina, could I ask you, uh, one of your comments was um, uh, around black women exp experiencing um, symptoms of menopause uh, two years earlier than their white counterparts. And I wonder what your thoughts are on the opportunity to intervene earlier on. Have we still got Nina with us? No, then I'll I'll I'll, I'll pose that question to Catherine. I'm, I am. Here, oh, we have, Ruth. we have. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Nina, you 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 told us um, that, you know, around the evidence that black women are experiencing menopause two years earlier than their white counterparts. What well, what are your thoughts on intervening earlier in that in that group? It's having an, a transparent conversation I think for myself um, medically I'm now postmenopause and have been for several years mm -hmm. I was diagnosed as perimenopausal age 40 age 43 and I think it's lack of knowledge and awareness and understanding and n equals one we are all our own experiments but at the same time, when I entered that GP surgery, did they not register the symptoms that I'd been presenting on and off for several years down to one, ethnicity, and two, my age? Yeah. And when you combine both of those, it may have helped my transition yeah. through this particular period and you know as I said earlier on reflection it is a missed opportunity for people to inform others about perimenopause rather than going away and planting those seeds yes everyone is different and therefore the range of options to manage in that menopause but then Ruth also there's the understanding of as some people have mentioned previously about how each person responds to those experiences and it plays poles part due to conflicting factors such as adult child experiences, genetics, yeah. diet, down to even religion, social weathering, but yet as a black woman and race people don't want to have that conversation but when you couple the term base and adult child experiences and trauma, then could this be a possible reason why? But it's also untangling a huge network of all of those possibilities of why do black women experience menopause earlier than white women? And still a huge need for, for further research. Um, I, I, I suggest. Um, Nina, could you tell us some of the, uh, a little bit about the work that you do with Black Women in Menopause? So I decided to set up Black Women in Menopause firstly because I began to wonder where or why were there so few Black women and other groups not represented in the menosphere. Um, so 
for me, even though there are fantastic platforms out there where you can learn the knowledge about perimenopause, etc., what I did tend to find was it didn't resonate with myself on a personal level. Mm-hmm. Was most of those yeah those shared lived experiences of menopause are solely based on white women's menopausal experiences and my experience as a black woman cannot be validated based on a white woman's lived experiences our needs are different and it's also about being able to provide cultural competent conversations for example when i presented about my hair thinning being told oh but you've got such lovely thick head of hair i have a concern about my hair or the changes in the pigmentation on my skin and this is why i wanted to set up black women in menopause because ultimately I wanted to have people who look like me, but our stories are powerful when you're able to resonate and understand those that go through this with you, that do actually understand where you are coming from. And that that is why I set up Black Women in Menopause. So that when you see and hear stories from people who look like you, you feel more of a connection you know that they have an understanding of your background and your struggles and without a doubt being able to listen to that story is powerful and especially when one telling that story looks similar to yourself you know everyone should have images and stories of people who look like them that they can relate to it's part of who we are and how we can understand ourselves But you know what? It also gives support as as well as validation and allowing others to learn as well. Uh, It it sounds uh, an extremely important organisation and I think you've really underlined one of the main themes that that we've discussed today and that's about the importance of listening to the individual, about tailoring care and uh, and around making sure that people have the the support and the information and access of um, all of the choices that are available to them. So thank you so much um, uh, Nina for joining us today and, and to you Catherine. Uh, and also to to uh, Dr. Carl Neff, who's unfortunately had had to uh, leave us. So I'd like to to conclude this afternoon. Um, and first of all, thank again uh, our sponsors who are Stella um, and and also A Vogel. Thank you so much for um, RCNI for allowing us to come together to explore our. Uh, passion for improving the care of women um, in in menopause. Um, Thank you so much for sitting with the technical difficulties and challenges that we've had. I know that everyone's had to rattle through their presentations and in order to accommodate the time we haven't taken questions and for that I apologise. However, you will receive a a live recording um, of this available on demand you will receive a CPD certificate and um, the there are a number of hugely valuable resources uh, which you'll receive and I, I hope that um, you'll benefit from those and, and and also I'll reiterate from our presenter Emily Simon that those of us who are RCM members may wish to, to benefit from the one year's free trial of the Stella app all around um, uh, tailoring lifestyle choices. So thank you so much to everyone for joining us and that concludes today's event. Good afternoon.